Hello, and welcome to the My Heritage webinar series. I'm Miriam Pierre Louis, your host, broadcasting to you live from webinar headquarters in Massachusetts. Today, we have Mike Mansfield, who is with us live at the My Heritage offices in Lehigh, Utah, for his class, Following Your Family's Immigration Trail on My Heritage. Thanks to Mike, and thanks to all of you for registering for today's live webinar. So, wherever and whenever you are, glad to have you with us. I hope this is now on your calendars for this September. If you've ever wanted to visit Amsterdam, here's your chance to do that and to take in a genealogy conference at the same time. The second annual My Heritage Live will be held September 6th through 8th. More information or to register is available at live2019.myheritage.com. And Jeff will be there in Amsterdam. So if you go, you'll have the chance to meet him. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Mike Mansfield works for MyHeritage.com as the Director of Content Operations. Previously, Mike has worked for Ancestry.com and FamilySearch and has been active in the genealogy and family history domain for the last 20 years. Mike has presented at numerous genealogical conferences and symposia in the United States, England, Scandinavia, and Australia. He holds a bachelor's degree in computer science from BYU and a master of science in library and information science from Syracuse University. Please put your virtual hands together and let's give Mike Manfield a nice warm webinar. Welcome. How are you, Mike? Welcome to the show. Good. Thank you. Let me make sure I'm showing my screen. Okay. I'm going to switch over to you. You'll see a little notice come up. Got it. Okay. That looks great. I'm going to mute myself. It's all yours. All righty. Hey, th thanks everybody for coming. This is a this is a very expansive topic. We could probably spend uh, the greater part of a day, maybe even a week together, but uh, we'll just spend an hour here and have some QA time at the end, and hopefully I'll touch on some some things that that might be uh, both familiar to you, but also new and uh, maybe unique, and some uh, tips and tricks as well. So really, what are we what are we talking about when we're looking for uh, our immigrant ancestor and, and where they're from? You know, often we have this case, or, or often as genealogists, where we we have a we have an ancestor, we have some identifying information about him or her uh, in the country where we've known them to arrive, but they're still sort of hidden in a way. We we may not know much or anything about their parents. We may not know much about their birth date or birthplace. And because we're lacking some of this contextual information, it, it's very difficult to find them in, in record collections, even collections that are well indexed, such as census or church records. And so we'll talk about ways in this talk to uh, hopefully uh, overcome some of these challenges. So the primary goal with uh, what we're trying to do here is really find the immigrant's place of origin. And knowing this opens the door to just a huge amount of genealogical goodies or research opportunities uh, and objectives. Uh, not only can we sort of complete the picture for uh, our immigrant ancestor, but also uh, get a lot of great information about his or her uh, immediate family, more information about his or her children, uh, his or her parents, uh, etc. It's just a very critical piece of information that we uh, really need to try to understand. And so when we look at this, you know, what are we talking about with place of origin? Uh, so, you know, in one sense, we can think about the birth location. Uh, might also be the last residence or residences in their original country. Really what we're after is where they were, where they would have caused records to be created. Uh, were they, you know, living in a place where they were baptized or christened, and so there would be a church record. Maybe they're in a place where there was some sort of uh, civil registration or census conducted. So in knowing, knowing this information about where they're from or where they lived or where they were born and the records that were generated around them are really what we're after as genealogists. And then our secondary goal here is, is really just to support the primary, and that is we want to collect evidence that can lead us to that primary goal. And... As I thought about this, you know, it's easy to think about a chain, but to me it's more of a chain reaction. Once we know this place of origin, 
once we have a birth location, we can jump into birth records uh, for that country or state or province uh, where our ancestors are from. Uh, with those birth records, we often uh, see the names of parents. It's very common at least to get the, the name of the mother and often the father in a birth record. Once we know the parents, we can confirm their marriage by looking through marriage records for that same uh, location where the birth occurred. That's often going to yield a, a good strategy or a good result. Once we have a marriage record, we can uh, very frequently we'll see the names of the bride's parents and the groom's parents in those marriage records. It's leading us to additional generations. And if we know the parents and, and their location, uh, we can find other siblings of our ancestor. We can read through birth registers looking for, you know, births that are occurring at regular intervals to the same couple. And once we know parents and children, we can jump back into census records where we can confirm what we've been finding through looking at for example, those birth records, like I mentioned, look for other family members that we may have missed, other extended family members that a census might reveal, and census records can lead us to entire family groups. And really what's a very important uh, concept that, that I really want to stress here is as we're looking at our immigrant ancestor, sometimes we're, we're dealing with a, a difficult situation. Maybe they have a, a name like an example from the U.S. I would use would be John Smith, a very, very common given name and a very, very common surname. In fact, the most common of, of both in this example, John Smith. So if I have a John Smith and I'm trying to use some of these techniques, it can get a little challenging. And so knowing who are the siblings of my John Smith, was there an Ebenezer Smith? Okay, that's going to help me tremendously have a more unique a uh, person or name that I can look for, knowing who are the cousins of these people. Remember, these people are all coming from the same place generally. So if I if I hit a dead end with, with my direct uh, ancestor, I can often have success by jumping to a secondary or a collateral ancestor as well. And then finally, once we have family groups, uh, we're just off to the races with all sorts of options. We can do descendancy research, uh, additional uh, ancestry uh, research as well. It just opens the door to us tremendously once we can get that that birth location and hopefully some notion of, of a date about when they might have been there. All right, so here's the outline of what we'll talk about. I'm going to talk a little bit about this concept of working from the known to the unknown, and this really applies across all uh, genealogical pursuits that we do, but it's particularly important here because we can get ourselves into trouble if we're not careful. I'll talk just for a moment also about primary sources and secondary sources and direct evidence and indirect evidence. Particularly in this field of, of looking at immigration, we need to kind of always have these uh, concepts in the back of our mind as we look at, at, at records. An important uh, thing that I, I definitely will spend a little bit of time on as well is what I call reverse Anglicization and Americanization. This refers to uh, the changes that have occurred to our, our family member or ancestors' names as they came to, for example, the United States or Canada or other places where uh, the language of that new country might have been different from where they were. I'll also show you some interesting surname distribution, distribu distribution maps and how to use these. And then we'll jump into some records. Uh, I do wish we had a lot more time. I could go into many other types that I, I just don't have time here in such a limited uh, session. But we'll certainly uh, talk just briefly about starting with what you have at home and then move into source records. Uh, particularly in this example, I'll be using naturalizations, passenger lists, census, military or military registrations, and newspapers. And that's you know, kind of the, the big five, I would say, and there's there's certainly other uh, records that we could include here that uh, are certainly helpful. All right, so this concept of working from the known to the unknown, it, it's really, really doing what a, a good detective understands, and that is we need to take what we know and have confidence in and the evidence that we know and use that to build a case for uh, inferences, conclusions about things that we don't yet know. So I want to start with a sort of a counterexample of what not to do. So, you know, maybe uh, when I was a late teenager just starting to get into genealogy, this is maybe something I would have been tempted to do and maybe even did, 
uh, with the limited resources that would have been available then. But for example, my paternal ancestor, uh, have a, uh, this ancestor of mine is named Matthew Mansfield. He was born in about 1810. And I also believe or understood he was born in Surrey, England, uh, one of the counties in England. And I think I understood by the mid-1840, he was in the United States. And I have a family uh, history that claims he lived on a settlement in Illinois on the Mississippi River. And the same family history says, well, he probably or must have come through the port of New Orleans and traveled up the Mississippi to Illinois. That sounds quite romantic. Unfortunately, uh, it's entirely rubbish. Uh, this notion of him going to the port of New Orleans uh, has been fun uh, proving and disproving information about this particular ancestor of mine, one of which is some of these family histories that I have are, are often more theoretical than actual, actually historical. So this is, again, what I, what I don't want to do is I don't want to come to a system like Super Search on my heritage. I'm going to go to the research uh, area of Super Search. I'm going to find our UK and Ireland census. Over here in the bottom right, I'm going to see that we have the 1841 England and Wales census. I'm going to put in the name of my, my immigrant ancestor, this Matthew Mansfield. I'm going to hit search. And Shazam, I get three records for a Matthew Mansfield in the 1841 census of England and Wales. I look at the birth years, and the first two are either too young or too old, and the third one's about right, between 1812 and 1816. Again, what I don't want to do is jump to a conclusion here that this is my guy, right? I really don't have near enough evidence, I uh, haven't done near enough work yet to really be able to disambiguate this man from these other men, and even if he was even here in England at the time. Maybe he left years before the census was even conducted. So jumping to conclusions can certainly be a dangerous sport, and we just really need to be cautious about the work that we do uh, when we're trying to do sort of, you know, well uh, thought out methodical genealogical research. I want to mention just a little bit about primary source and secondary source or sources. Here's a death certificate from Henry Ford. Wouldn't it be great if all of our immigrant ancestors had such a thing, a, a death certificate that gives us information about where this person died and also some information about where he was born? Unfortunately, at least in the United States and many other countries, uh, Civil registration uh, is a fairly modern invention, right? In the United States, most states, especially, you know, once you get sort of west of the East Coast, most states didn't start civil registration until the early 1900s. So here we have a, a death certificate for Henry Ford. And what we mean by primary source is, is the information on this document very near in time to when the event occurred? The closer that that information is to when the document was recorded gives us more confidence that the information is correct and that the person reporting the information to whomever was recording it had probably firsthand experience with the event that just happened. So in this case for Henry Ford, I'm going to highlight in blue here what I consider to be primary source information, and that is we have a place of death. He died in Wayne County in the city of Dearborn. We even have the name of the hospital. I'd also say that a primary bit of information here is his date of death, April 7th, 1947, his cause of death, and the place where he was born. You can see that all these events happened within, or his burial and his death happened within just a few days of each other. And then in red here, I'm going to put what I think to be, what I would consider to be secondary sources. So this is information provided by the informant. In this case, if we look down below, this is Mrs. Henry Ford, meaning uh, Mr. Ford's wife, who we also see on the certificate is this Clara Bryant. Uh, she was in her mid-80s at the time, I believe, when this or late 70s, early 80s, when uh, her husband passed away. So she's probably providing this information that she believed that Henry was born on this day in 1863. And in this birthplace, and we see the name of the spouse, and then we get what she believed to be the birthplaces of Mr. Ford's father and mother. 
And you can see a good example here where for uh, Mr. Ford's mother, she uh, put unknown as her birthplace. So uh, I'm not exactly sure, you know, if, if uh, Clara never really had a relationship with Mary, if they never really talked about where Mary was from, maybe Mary had passed away long before Clara uh, came into the family. It's a little unknown. So we kind of have a mix of primary uh, information here and secondary information. And then quickly another comment about two different types of evidence, direct evidence. This gives us a straightforward fact uh, from, a, from a record. An example might be an infant's baptismal record. These records will often state the birth date of a child along with the christening date or the baptismal date. And so this statement of a birth date in an infant's uh, baptismal record would be direct evidence. Uh, indirect evidence, uh, also in many cases on an infant baptismal record, uh, we may only see the date of the baptism and it tells us nothing about the birth date. In this case, we can make a reasonable inference or a conjecture about that birth date, especially from uh, based on what we know from local customs and norms. So for example, here's an example of a baptism which has both a birth date and a christening date. So this is direct evidence of the birth date. And then here's another uh, baptismal record that shows us only the baptismal date and is entirely silent about the actual birth date. So in this case, we could infer a possible birth date of, you know, maybe a week to two weeks prior to the baptismal date. That would be some indirect evidence that we would infer from the bottom example. All right, so laying a solid foundation for our research. So instead of doing what I showed earlier with my direct uh, paternal ancestor there, Matthew Mansfield, I want to go back and start looking at what can I find out about this ancestor's death. One of the most important things we can do is always kill off our ancestors. That sounds a little bit morbid, but what I mean is, is make sure that we we were, we're hunting down information about their death, looking at their, uh, for example, their burial information, obituaries, probate records, other things that we that they would have left or records that would have been generated when they died. We also want to look at the marriages, uh, one marriage or, or more marriages that they may have been in. This will often give us information and context that will be helpful in our research. Information about the occupation, what children did this person uh, have? What other extended family member members and residence locations here in a place that, that we know that they that they lived uh, can also help us find out where they might uh, have come from. And then also any information we can get about birth dates or just even a birth year will be extremely helpful. And then finally, even if we just only get a country of origin, so we'll talk a little bit later about passenger lists. Uh, a wonderful resource, but unfortunately, until the early 1900s, they often only give us a country of origin and don't uh, help us too much with exact places within a specific country. We also want to look at uh, documents we may have or be able to find about their citizenship or naturalization. And I'll talk about naturalizations in just a moment. Military service or military registration, civic service, religion, uh, property ownership, uh, travel, did they go back to a country in Europe? This may indicate uh, that they were returning home for a time. Uh, internal migration, once they were in a country, say like the United States or Canada Austra or Australia, were they moving to different places? Uh, that can lead us to a trail of records that can help us find uh, information about where they ultimately had uh, immigrated from. Uh, education, and then his or her name, and this is one of particular importance that I want to dive into for just a little bit, is looking at uh, names and how we can reverse English's, do this reverse anglicization. So this is this process or this change that happens to non-English language uh, personal names and how they get modified or, or transformed to different spellings. Uh, sometimes it's a phonetic spelling, sometimes it's a translation of a surname uh, into, into English. Uh, there's a nice uh, article on Wikipedia there where you can read more about this process and there's a few links there that will take you to some other uh, sources. Uh, back when I was in uh, college as an undergraduate, I ran into this book uh, that I've just loved ever since called The Foreign Version of English Names. 
And what this book does is it presents uh, information like this. So over on the left, we have given names in English on the left column. Uh, if you have an ancestor with the name of Elizabeth, uh, buckle up because it's one of the most, uh, it's, it's really the, the, the given name with the most number of known variants that I've ever seen. Some lists that I've seen add up to over 1,200 known different spellings or variants. So there in the middle you see Elizabeth spelled with an S and at the bottom we have an Elizabeth spelled with a Z. So for example, if I'm trying to find this, uh, an Elizabeth in Russian, or Italian, this table can help me find other forms of this name that I may want to definitely include in my search as I'm looking at records from, say, Italy or Russia. Uh, here I'm giving you a link to a digital copy of this book at Hathi Trust. This book was actually initially published by the U.S. Department of Justice. It should be in the public domain as a federal work. Unfortunately, Hathi Trust has some uh, copyright controls on it, which is a, bit, a little bit discouraging. Someday I'm just going to buy a copy of this book and put it online somewhere uh, so that we all have a little easier access to it. But you will find an earlier version there at Hathi Trust. Another site that I would recommend is this one called BehindTheName.com, where you can do things like that table uh, would also do, where you can put in an English given name and it will help you see uh, various forms of it in other languages. You can also, with some uh, pretty easy Google searching, find specialized forms uh, that will, uh, specialized sites and, and services that will help you reverse, do this reverse anglicization of other names. For example, here's a nice site that has a really robust list for Sicilian and Italian given names. So there's, uh, I'm not an Italian research expert, but there's certainly names on here that surprised me. For example, about halfway down in the pink column, there's this Anu Nuzetta, which they're saying in English, uh, someone likely would have taken the English name of Nancy for that one. So knowing how our ancestors' names likely changed as they came to uh, their new homes is very important. Another specific uh, site that I like is Nordic Names. So nordicnames.de. This site was particularly helpful in me cracking a case that I'll show in one of my case studies near the end, where I had a woman in my tree that had a middle name, Karen, and I just was struggling to find good matches for her. So I, I looked at this side, I put in Karen, and down here at the bottom, I get this C also, this K-A-J-S-A -S -S -A form, which I'd never really considered before. And if I looked that up or clicked on that link, it takes me here and it shows me that this is a Swedish pet form name of Karen. And so this was a very important revelation to me in helping me find this particular woman, uh, the Swedish ancestor of mine, and finding her in some Swedish records. And I'll show that in just a, a little bit later. So here is uh, specifically this uh, Swedish couple. So I, has, I have Gustav Johnson. That's how I know him here in the United States. When I inherited my my grandparents' papers and genealogy uh, archives, so to speak. This is what I what I knew from them, that I had this man, Gustav Johnson, and I knew he, uh, his birthday, his birth year, and his, his death year, and that he was married to this woman, Maria Karen Jansen. So this is what I knew them, or how I know them here in the U.S. Obviously, with a, with a woman like this, I need to be very cautious and careful to think about what is really her surname. Uh, a proper Swedish patronymic that at least would be spelled with two S's and likely it would be even better spelled as Jan's daughter, or is it something else? Meaning this, this woman lived right during the time in Sweden when uh, the patronymic practice was beginning to end. So it's possible that her father's name actually was Jan's and this is a proper patronymic, or it's possible that her father's name was Jansen. And this is more of a traditional surname inheritance like we use here in the United States and which Sweden has adopted since the late 1800s. So by going through this process, I, I, I come to this conclusion that Gustav is likely, might still be a Gustav, but his surname is going to be something like Johansson. And this Maria, I'm going to, instead of Karen, I'm going to consider a woman named Maria Kajesa, and I'm going to kind of leave a question mark for her surname. I'm unsure if it's Jansen or Jan's daughter, or potentially it could be something as you know different as as Hansen or 
uh, Anderson. It's it's kind of unknown to me what what her uh, surname might be in Sweden. And I'll show you that uh, case study in just a minute. Surname distribution maps. These are a fun resource that give us uh, ways to infer, again, for information about uh, some of our uh, ancestors that have migrated. And really how these work is depending on the country of origin and you know, kind of kind of depends on the country. It's, it is sometimes possible to determine where a surname originated. Uh, certain countries, like the Nordic countries, like in Sweden, Denmark, Finland, and Norway, these maps wouldn't be helpful, right? Everyone is named Hansen and Christensen and Anderson, but in other localities, it, it, they can be quite helpful if you have sort of a rare or uncommon surname. And what these sites and services do is they graphically display locations where surnames occurred at different periods in time. And this can give us a starting point for research in a birth country if we've really kind of exhausted what other records we might be able to currently find or access uh, either online uh, or in archives. That's, as I mentioned, it works best for less common surnames. So let me show you uh, some examples. A good place to find some of these is at the Family Search Research Wiki, at this URL that I'm showing here, the surname distribution maps. They've compiled some of them, certainly not an exhaustive list, but some of the main ones are listed here. And so this is what you'll see at that Family Search uh, Research Wiki page. And if I go to this one for France, uh, this is a, a very nice one that I've had some uh, quite a bit of fun and success with in France. Here in this box, if I put in a common surname in France, like Martin, Martin is sort of the uh, French equivalent of Smith. It is the most common surname in the entire country you're gonna see, I'm not gonna get a very helpful result here, but what this site is doing, it's showing me by all of the French departments, all of the departments within continental France, as well as their overseas possessions, a list of how many times the surname is occurring by different time periods that I can select. So for a common surname, this isn't gonna be that helpful, but if I go to another surname that's less common, like this uh, Aubinet surname here, I'm shown a very helpful map where this surname in the last uh, about 100 years or so has only, or yeah, about a last 100 years, a little bit more, has only been seen in five departments. And most of those are within a single department uh, there in the very black called Latte Garonde. I can click on that link and it gives me some other information about uh, specific uh, communes, uh, these lower level jurisdictions within France. And I can look up these places, I can go to Wikipedia, and I can see, well, there's not much here. There is a kind of a map, I can see where this place is. One sort of tip I would give you if you haven't done this, it's certainly quite fun. When you see a page like this about a, con about a place like in France, or really doesn't matter where, I often look to see if there's a version of this page in the language where the location is, in this case I'll click on the Francais uh, language for French, and if I'm using Google Chrome, I'll get an option to automatically translate this page, which I'll do, and you'll see that I have a very much more uh, content-rich page about this particular commune in France. So if you haven't used uh, those other languages, in Wikipedia, I very, very often see much more robust information in non-English uh, languages for sites or for pages about places and topics uh, out, you know, that are not necessarily specific to uh, United States, Canada, the other parts of the English-speaking world. All right, so records at home. Again, you definitely want to start here. You want to think about what journals, Bibles, letters are in your your own possession what might be in the uh, archives, so to speak, of your cousins, your siblings. Definitely look through these. You'll often find naturalization documents, uh, newspaper clippings. You might find an obituary or other announcement that would lead you to uh, evidence about your uh, the origins of some of your ancestors. I want to dive a little bit into specific record types. We'll look at some naturalizations first. Specifically in the USA, I wish I had time to go over naturalization sort of practices around the globe. Uh, I do give uh, some 
references to a few other countries here in just a few moments, but we'll be looking primarily here at the USA for this segment. Uh, so the Naturalization uh, Act of 1790 really kicked off the uh, legal framework under which naturalizations were done. So naturalization is the process of a person changing their citizenship. So in 1790, it required two years of residency. Uh, we've had a number of subsequent naturalization acts. There's another one in 1795. It increased the residency requirement and also introduced this notion of declaring your intent to change your citizenship. Uh, prior to actually uh, going through the final process. Uh, naturalization acts continued throughout the 1800s, uh, with one as early as 1802, and plus nine, at least nine more that I can count, and 23 additional federal naturalization acts in the 1900s, and in the 2000s we've already had eight more specific federal uh, legislative acts that have impacted naturalization. And we'll also look at just a moment at derivative citizenship. So when you won't expect to find a naturalization for one of your immigrant uh, ancestors based on if they were, for example, uh, a child or perhaps a spouse, particularly a, a, a wife, a, a female uh, in this case. So naturalization in the USA, uh, looking at derivative citizenship, so children and wives We'll also look at the Naturalization Act of 1855, which kind of solidified the, the notion here. And it says, any woman who might lawfully be naturalized under the existing laws married or who shall be married to a citizen of the United States shall be deemed and taken to be a citizen. This was in force until September 1922. At that point in 1922, a, a new Naturalization Act required that uh, women go through their own separate naturalization act. But starting as early as 1790, children receive derivative citizenship from their father, or in limited cases, their mother, and no paperwork would have been generated for those children. Which means, you know, for a very long period of time, at least here in the United States, a child of an immigrant could or, or would prove his or her own citizenship through their, through their parents, particularly their father's certificate of naturalization. Here's an example of a declaration of intention on the left. Uh, this is uh, for uh, Albert Einstein, and then the certificate of naturalization that he received a few years later on the right. The declarations of intention are, are much more genealogically rich. You see we have all sorts of information there about uh, where he's from in Germany, uh, his occupation, uh, his marriage date, who he's married to, uh, last places that they lived, uh, some information about children. So these declarations of intention are sort of uh, the main thing that we're trying to go for when we're looking at naturalization records. Uh, we could spend the whole session just talking about naturalizations. I'm gonna give you a few uh, URLs here to some sites that, 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 that I like to start with. Again, the Family History Research Wiki hosted by Family Search. Library and Archives Canada, if you're looking at naturalization or citizenship changes in Canada. Uh, there's some wonderful information there at LAC, and likewise at the National Archives of Australia. And you'll see this pattern really with lots of different uh, archives around the world that generally they, at the national level, are uh, often maintaining and providing access, increasingly better access to naturalization records. Unfortunately, uh, in the world of, of online databases, you will find pockets of naturalization records. We have some indexes on MyHeritage, actually some big indexes, millions and millions of records, but there's still uh, a very large volume of naturalization records that have not been digitized or robustly indexed. So uh, you kind of have to dig a little deep sometimes, uh, going to actual archives and, and repositories to find those intentions of declaration if you don't already have them in your family's personal papers. Let's look a little bit at passenger arrival records. Uh, I will here quickly just give a uh, link to a webinar that I did uh, here in the MyHeritage webinar series uh, on the Family Tree webinars. This is a, a free webinar. Uh, I gave it, uh, as you can see there, in November of 2017. A lot of more detailed information uh, there about uh, passenger arrival records, specifically for New York and some of the work that we've done uh, to augment those records. I'll pull a little bit from that uh, presentation here. 
So if we look at immigration to the United States, and, and a similar pattern would be seen in other countries where the economic conditions of the country where an immigrant was going to had a huge impact on the uh, volume of persons that were arriving. So what this chart shows is on the bottom, we have the years since 1820 to 1970, and it gives me the volume of persons that uh, arrived, in this case, to the United States. If we flip this on its side, we can start to overlay uh, various world events, uh, whether famines, economic conditions, uh, wars and conflicts. So there in the early 1840s, we have the great uh, famine in Ireland, which caused a huge uh, influx of Irish immigrants. The Homestead Act, particularly appealing to many persons in uh, Northern Europe and the Nordic countries to come to the United States to get uh, a lack of a tract of land that they could farm. And then, just like we've seen in, in our own lifetimes, there's been a long history of economic depressions and panics and recessions throughout the history of the United States. So in the Panic of 1873, there was what was called the Long, de long uh, Depression. It was estimated that business activity declined by almost 33%. And so uh, if I'm a person living in Germany wondering if I should immigrate in the mid-1870s, the United States may not have been so appealing at the time, and I may have decided to go elsewhere. Maybe maybe Australia was a better option during the mid-1870s because of this panic. We have another depression in the mid-1800s, another panic in the late 1890s, another one in 1907, and then the start of World War I, which saw just a huge decline in immigration, and then another depression uh, terminated by the Immigration Act of 1924, which sort of stopped the uh, open, sort of open door policy of United States immigration. Uh, some other charts that I just quickly want to show. This is a, a, a visualization, set of visualizations I did from the U.S. Federal Census. I was trying to look at uh, information that we have in the census about where people are born and where they lived. So the way these charts work is on the left-hand side of the circle, we have the country of birth, in this case as reported in the 1850 census. On the right side, the region by uh, the, it's actually states that I grouped into regions where the person lives. So here on the left, we have where they're coming from, and on the right, we have uh, the region of the country that they live in. So you can see here in 1850, there's just a huge number, percentage of, of Irish immigrants with a very large contingent of German and English, almost none, very, very few uh, people from Poland, Italy, the Nordic countries, other parts of Eastern Europe at the very top there. We can also pull out a specific country, for example, 1850 Ireland. We see that uh, most of them actually went to the Middle Atlantic. We sometimes get this notion that, well, they Maybe they ended up in the Massachusetts area, but uh, predominantly the Irish, at least in 1850, were finding themselves in the middle Atlantic states. So New York, New Jersey, uh, uh, those, those states are Pennsylvania in the, in the middle, mid-Atlantic. By 1880, we see uh, the percentages start to shift. Again, still a very large percentage from Ireland and Germany but the Nordic countries are starting to send more and more of their population to the United States and still some uh, healthy immigration also from Canada at the bottom. 1890, again, Nordics uh, increasing as is Poland and Russia and other places in Eastern Europe and Italy is really starting to come in. And so what we're seeing here are people that uh, in 1900 reported their uh, place of birth as Italy. And by 1920 and 1940, we see sort of the, the grand melting pot where we have really people from all over uh, the world in various uh, parts of the, of the United States, from Russia to Poland, uh, Mexico, uh, Western Europe, really all over uh, the map. All right, so the passenger arrival record, just some brief history. Uh, Representative Thomas Newton from Virginia proposed a bill in 1819 to improve the conditions for passengers who are arriving on the shores of the United States. Uh, in, in one example I quote here, uh, so there was a, an example from one ship that sailed from a European port, more than 700 of the 1,267 persons on board 
died in transit. So the conditions were, were pretty bad, and uh, it was certainly within the government's interest to act. And in 1819, they enacted legislation which improved the conditions uh, of these uh, passenger vessels and also required that uh, we start collecting some records about these immigrants that were coming. The good news is all known and extant customs passenger lists have been accessioned by the National Archives. Immigration acts continued to follow in 1882. Uh, Congress passed additional legislation uh, following on from other le legislative efforts that had occurred in the, in the mid 1800s. And by 1882, there was this need for even more uh, serious reform, uh, greater provisionings against overcrowding, specific sizes and requirements for the size of a berth or the, the, the space where a, an immigrant might sleep and that they were be to and that they were to be provided at least three cooked meals uh, each day. The bad news about passenger lists is they can be sometimes pretty hard to to use and to get helpful information from. So here's an example from 1890 fairly late uh, again, in, in sort of passenger record keeping, where all we get is really a country where these people are coming from. You see the first four there are Germany, and the bottom two are also Germany. By 1897, we have uh, shipping lines. I've started to create uh, sort of a standardized uh, form here that was uh, also then, I believe, adopted by the federal government. So in this case, we're seeing things like nationality, and their last residence. So here we have some very uh, excellent information about not only, for example, are some of these people uh, Irish, but I'm getting, we're seeing uh, names of cities and other more specific localities here. In 1898, uh, the federal government here in the United States added a very important question to the passenger list, not only for New York, but for the other ports as well that asked about the name and relationship of the relative in the USA where this uh, person was going to be with or kind of going to stay with. And so we've recently uh, indexed these and, and published these. Uh, so there was these additional relationships added about 16 million more uh, records to the collection. And then in 1907, yet another new question was uh, put on the form, which is of extreme uh, usefulness uh, for this purposes that we're talking about here, where I get the name and the relationship of the relative, or usually just a single relative in the old country, and sometimes with a, with a fairly uh, complete address. So by this time in uh, the passenger arrival manifest, again, not only for the Port of New York, but for the other ports, we have uh, sort of two pages, a left side and a right side. And something else we did is we merged these together so that it's uh, fairly easy to see uh, that the lines continue across the left page onto the right page. So in that talk that I referenced from 2017, one of the questions that I addressed in the Q&A session was what about the other ports? We recently did this exact same treatment for Boston, Massachusetts, or completed it and published it uh, just about a month ago. And about a month prior to that, we also completed the same treatment for Philadelphia, uh, adding again, addition, uh, you know, adding millions of additional names and relationships to these passenger records about persons here in the United States the passengers were coming to be with, as well as uh, persons in the old country that they left behind. And more coming soon. So I'm happy to tell you that we're doing this exact same thing with uh, Many of the other ports, such as Honolulu and Baltimore, uh, those two will be coming up uh, hopefully in the next few weeks, and then followed later uh, this summer by San Francisco, New Orleans, some ports in North Carolina, and et cetera, on down the list. All right, let's look a little bit at census. Again, I'm going to focus uh, much of my talk in this segment, again, on the U.S. Again, I wish I uh, had time to include some of the same analysis for Canada, uh, the United Kingdom, uh, the Nordic countries where we just have incredible census records. But let's look at what we can here and again, think about the patterns that I'm showing and maybe less about the specifics, right? So obviously with a census, we're always gonna get the place where the person lives and starting even in 1850, the first uh, census in the US where we have a name for every person, we're getting this question, place of birth, naming the state, territory, or country. Again, in many cases here, I'm just getting the name of a country. As you can see uh, the, near the bottom, I'm getting England 
and Ireland, and also the states uh, New York a couple times. 1860, sometimes we win the genealogical lottery, and this is a case where this particular census taker was very, first of all, he has incredible handwriting, that's just amazing, and he went above and beyond his call of duty, so to speak, and he not only gave us the country, but also the county and city in many places. So that first one, I have County Galway in Ireland. That is just incredibly valuable information if that is your Irish ancestor. To know what county they're from is, is just like hitting a home run. And you can see here for uh, the majority of this list, he's doing the same thing for other immigrants here in Ireland. So definitely check some of these earlier censuses. Sometimes you'll get lucky and you'll find one like this that has more information than is often otherwise shown. By 1880, we have a question about not only where the person uh, him, sir, himself or herself is from, but where uh, their parents are from. So in this example, that top line, uh, this person is from Norway, as is his father and his mother. Whoops, I'm going the wrong direction. Let's go this way. 1890. If it hadn't been uh, heavily damaged in a fire and then later destroyed, uh, this is what we would have seen. There's just a, a very few of these uh, survive, but in 1890 they had sort of a special form for each family, and I get information about, again, where the person's from and where their parents are from, as well as the number of years in the United States and whether or not they've been naturalized. So that starts to kick off this pattern that the U.S. Uh, census or the, the government agencies conducting the census started to adopt, and that is giving us information about naturalization. So here's an example from one of my Norwegian ancestors, this uh, Andrew Martin Andresen. I get his date of birth, including his month, with his, which is just awesome, and then his year of immigration, how many years he's been in the country, uh, the number of years this couple's been married, and whether or not this man's been naturalized. You can see that they didn't bother bother recording naturalizations about the spouse and the children. Again, they would have uh, received their citizenship as a derivative of uh, this man at the top, this Andrew Martin Andresen citizenship. And I can see that these bottom four are born in the state of Utah, where the top two were born in Norway, and I get their birth years. 1910, a similar thing. We get a uh, year of immigration and their uh, naturalization status. One quick comment about these naturalization codes that you see in really the 1900 through 1930 census is PA stands for papers filed. It doesn't mean that they were naturalized, uh, for example, in the state of Pennsylvania. It means that they've, they've basically in, declared their intention is, is how you, we would read this. An AL would mean that they're an alien, mean they, they haven't declared their intention to naturalize. Or NA, that they've been naturalized. Or NR, not reported, and of course they can be blank. It's never been a requirement for an immigrant to naturalize in the United States, and many immigrants never went through the process. Uh, I believe that is also true for other countries around the world as well. The 1920 census, again, similar questions with the citizenship, but we get this really cool information about the language that these persons spoke. So in this case, I'm at the top line, we see that this person and their parents are both born in Russia, but they speak Yiddish. That's a very uh, interesting clue about information that might lead me to discover that they're of Jewish or Ashkenazi uh, Jewish descent. Uh, Yiddish is sort of the a historical language used primarily by the Ashkenazi Jews. The 1930 census, uh, again, it just kind of varies year to year. We're getting uh, information about, uh, again, where they're born and where their parents are born. The 1940 census takes us a little bit back in that we get information about the places of birth and their residents, but unless you get really lucky and happen to have family members that are in these supplemental questions, you just certainly want to check for these, see if you again won the genealogical lottery. So in this case, line 14 and line 29, down here at the bottom for these two people on this form, we will get information about the birthplaces of the father and the mother. So in this case, we see Lithuania and Poland. 
So maybe your direct ancestor wasn't in one of these special supplemental questions, but maybe his brother was, or his his wife was, or, or someone else that would be uh, very interesting to look into. Another one I want to talk about is the World War I draft registrations, uh, 17, 1917 to 1918. This is an incredible collection that can often go overlooked for immigration purposes. So uh, in 1917, the Selective Service Act was made or enacted, required all men to register uh, between the ages of 21 to 31. The first registration was held in June or June 5th. A second registration where they picked up another year of, of young men who had turned 21 uh, happened in 1918. And then uh, the planners at the War Department must have been getting nervous about how the war was going, and they enacted a, another registration in August of 1918 where they expanded the year range to include all men aged 18 to 45. So really what we have here is an incredible collection of information of virtually about all men born between September 12, 1873 and September 12, 1900. This helps us fill in that gap a little bit for that destroyed 1890 U.S. federal census. So let me show you an example. So here in my heritage, if I look at this collection, uh, I'll find a record like this for this uh, man named Luigi Caprioli. And if I look at the image, uh, these were uh, a double-sided card that we see the uh, front on the left and the back on the right. And if I zoom in here to the front page, we see information about uh, that he's an alien and that it also gives us an exact place, a uh, city and uh, province here in Salerno, Italy, where this man was born. Just tremendous information. Another example is here's a here's a young man age 21, so he was picked up in that second registration, and it gives us a place in Macedonia, Greece, where he was born. It also gives us information about his father's birthplace, and also the name of his nearest relative, who, if you look below, also still lives in Greece. So just incredible information in these World War I draft registration cards. If you have any men in your family that uh, could have participated in this registration, especially migrants or immigrants, you definitely want to look into these to see what you can find. Here's another example where this person is, he's only saying that he's a subject or citizen of Greece, a little disappointing, that's all we get, but if we look down lower, we'll see that he lists his nearest relative living in this very specific place in Greece. So just a, an incredible resource. I'd encourage you to look at it uh, if you have a little bit of time. Here's some counts I just pulled of this collection in almost half a million Italians, or over half a million Italians, over half a million Russians. Just incredible array of, of immigrants were picked up by this World War I draft registration. All right, let's look at a quick case study. So here's an example that I, I was working on just a few, uh, actually just last week as I was preparing uh, for this talk. Here's a Luigi Russo. He's in the 1920 U.S. federal census and he's Italian. In fact, he's Italian, his wife's Italian, his parents, her parents, everyone's Italian, but that's all we learned from the census. Everyone's Italian. And in 1920, he's 31 years old and he lives at this 56 Bremen Street. So here's, an exa here's his record from the census. I can see that he lives in Suffolk, Massachusetts. He's in Bremen Street at 56, or he's at 56 Bremen Street. So here's his information, a little more detail. And what I wanna try to do is let's find this uh, person's place of birth using the World War I draft card that I just mentioned. So here's, here's his World War I draft card. You'll notice a, a few things here. One, his age doesn't quite match. Here he's saying he's 30 in 1917, yet the census has him as 31. Again, this goes into secondary and uh, primary and secondary evidence. I would say that this is likely uh, a case where this uh, age is much more reliable than the age in the census. Other information that we have here is that he's a shoemaker. On the census document, we see that his occupation here is a shoe cutter or a sole cutter. He works in a shoe factory. He also lives at a place here that we see as 58 Bremen Street, so maybe one door over. 
it just looks like a very high quality uh, match here. And his wife and three children also make sense from what we saw in the census. Uh, newspapers, if you haven't used newspapers on MyHeritage recently, you, you definitely need to. Just in the last about 18 months, we've published uh, almost 60 million uh, pages of newspapers from around the country. Uh, you definitely want to look at obituary. So here's the person that I started with and my what not to do. Here's my Matthew Mansfield. It gives me information about uh, the exact parish in Surrey or in England that he was born. It gives me his birth date. It tells me that he left England in 1831 and went to Canada. And then another uh, ancestor of mine, this gentleman from Sweden, giving me information about his birth date and particularly a uh, very specific location in Sweden where he was born. Coming back to this case study, I'm sorry, I have this a little bit out of order that I wanted to go through. Let's look at this Luigi Wu, so just a little bit more. In the World War I draft registration, he lives at 58 Bremen Street. He's a shoemaker. His birth date is on March 9th, 1887. At this point where I end, he lives in this place called Rodi, according to uh, Fugia, according to the World War I draft registration. Uh, doing some quick uh, search in Wikipedia, I find this place called Rodi Garaciano. Garganciano, I'm sorry, I, I don't speak Italian, so I'm slaughtering the, uh, the pronunciation. But I find this place, and I also know that Family Search has been very active in publishing civil registration images. Now, they don't have many indexed yet. I can't do a search for these, but I can certainly come here. Now that I know a birthplace and a birth date and a name, I can very quickly make some really nice progress. So I'm going to come to Family Search. I'm going to look at this civil registration collection they have for Fogia. And I can click on this link to browse through about 706,000 images. Luckily, I don't have to look at them all. I'm going to go just to this specific locality, this Rodi. And I'm going to look here at this next list. I'm going to see that they have uh, what I believe in Italian are birth uh, registrations, some sort of marriage bans, marriage certificates, and deaths for this date range that I need. And I'm taken to an interface like this. And again, I'm not going to look at all 3,282, but I'm going to jump around, kind of like doing a dictionary search. And here I'm looking at the year and day. So this is the 18th, this is the 5th of March, 1887. And this one down here is the 9th of March, which is the day I'm looking for. And here's my guy, this Luigi Russo. And if I zoom in here, I get all sorts of just incredible information about this, this gentleman, including his father, his mother, uh, this is the gold that we're looking, the gold that we're looking for, right, when we do this work. One more quick case study before uh, I wrap up is this example I've used before of this Swedish couple of mine where I did this process to try to reverse anglicize their Swedish names. And I come up with this Gustav Janusson and this Maria Kajesa. Again, I'm still not sure about her surname. And so I know that they're born in Sweden. I learned from his obituary. I, I got a birth date. I got a place, this Lindhova. I also know from some other uh, census research that they have a child named Frida, a child named Alma, and a child named Sarah Marie. That's actually my direct ancestor. And I know she was born in the United States, that's Sarah Marie. So I can then go and see if we can find this couple in a just incredible collection we have on MyHeritage called the Sweden Household Examination Books. I also talk about this collection in a Nordic uh, research webinar that I did here at the Legacy webinar series. And coming here and using this information that I've kind of reverse engineered about their Swedish names, I'm very easily able to find this record where I see Gustav Johansson, Hustra, his, his wife, Maria Kajesa Petter's daughter. So, wow, I'm finally seeing what is likely to be her proper patronymic surname. I'm seeing the birth dates, the marriage date, the place both uh, both of these uh, people are born. And over on the right, I see this interesting note by the Lutheran minister that they left for America on June 11th, 1879. So there are certainly incredible national uh, index collections. Uh, we could spend a long time going through things like the US Census. I didn't even touch on state censuses that are available. Uh, Canadian censuses, England and Wales, civil registration. We have an incredible set of uh, 
census records for all of the Nordic countries now on MyHeritage. We recently just published several from Norway with more to come. We have a nice collection from the Netherlands. And you'll find other very good collections such as uh, Filet.com if you're looking for people in France. I definitely give you a, a hint to look at Filet. They have a really robust index that they've been making. And uh, another example, if you need Scotland index, uh, Scotland censuses, scotlandspeople.gov.uk is a good place to go. So conclusion, we've looked at some methods for collecting evidence and finding immigrant ancestors. Paying attention to careful and methodical research can certainly lead us to new discoveries. I, I really hope and encourage you to, to try again if you've tried before. There, there are new collections that are available now that weren't just a few years ago that will aid you in your research. We talked about some of the collections that can help us, such as naturalizations, census, military registration, uh, newspapers, etc. And again, there's never been a better time than now to be successful at this work. So with that, let's jump into Q&A. Again, my name is Mike. Here's my email address. Uh, if you have questions or comments that you don't have time uh, to get to me today or would be better offline, I'm always happy to hear from you there. Hi, Mike. That was great. Sorry, I was trying to type. Don't, don't change that slide yet. I'm trying to type your email. Uh, so that the audience can have that there, myheritage.com. Sorry, my typing and my multitasking aren't so quick. Here we go. All right. David is saying, incredible, wonderful, uh, incredible webinar. Thanks so much. Joe is saying, excellent. Uh, will this be available for free on the Legacy site? Yes, it will. It will be always free. Uh, Kay is saying, great webinar. It was truly a really great webinar. We had... Um, trouble kind of jotting down all the URLs and because you were just sharing so much great uh, stuff. But we have a lot of questions as a result. Let me do a couple um, announcements and then we will do the Q&A. So let me mute you for just a moment and then we'll, no problem. we'll bring Mike back on. Um, but let me just tell you about our next webinar for the MyHeritage series is Visualizing Ancestral Lines with DNA auto clusters. This is Tuesday, April 9th. This is, I can't tell you how awesome this webinar is going to be. This is one of the new features that they released during Roots Tech for the MyHeritage DNA. And this is, um, I, I always forget where this originally came from. But anyways, MyHeritage got a hold of it and is offering it to um, MyHeritage customers, DNA customers. And what it does is it, um, clusters your DNA and it puts um, it makes a visual chart for it and that's about as much as I can explain right now because I'll be tuning in on April 9th as well to learn how to really use that so I'm really excited about that I hope you're going to be uh, excited about that too if you've got your DNA over at my heritage which I hope you do um, this will be a really big help for you so make sure you tune in on that day all right, we need to give out some door prizes. So let me go over to my attendees list and I need to pick some, some winners here. All right, so our first door prize is a one year MyHeritage Complete Plan. Uh, so this is a premium plus family site subscription and also uh, a data subscription. So what I think this means is that all of the stuff that Mike covered in this webinar today, you'll be able to access through this door prize, through this one year MyHeritage Complete plan. So I'm just going to pick one person for this and that winner is Edward Kozlowski. So congratulations, Edward, you are the winner of the one year MyHeritage Complete plan. But we're not done, we've got one more. And our next door prize is a MyHeritage DNA test. So you'll get the DNA kit and then you'll, uh, I believe it's a, a spit test. I, I can't, it's been a while since I did mine actually, so I don't even remember anymore. And, and then you submit it, you mail it in and you'll get your results online and you'll be able to use the new tools that uh, MyHeritage has released and you'll be able to see who your uh, DNA matches are and also use the, the, um, the new tool that 
they'll be talking about it on April 9th. All right. I need to pick a winner for this. I always hate picking the DNA winner because I can only win, uh, pick one person, and that always makes me sad. But uh, hopefully a lot of you have already gotten your DNA tested. So the winner for this is Bobby Devendorf. So congratulations, Bobby. I hope you'll enjoy that. What else do we have here? All right, now we can get back to Mike and the questions. And we have a lot of questions. So let me bring Mike back on. There we go. He's unmuted. All right. Let's oh, we have a good amount of time. Um, so let's see. Surely, so, so we're going to have a, a variety of questions here, Mike, because of the variety of things that you touched on in your talk. Sure, sure. All right. So Shirley wants to know, how do I figure out where um, where somebody went first after getting off the ship at 1848 in Castle Garden? That I mean, that's an interesting question. I've never thought about that before. You know, where do you know where they went? Yeah, so yeah, so 18... Oh, I, Mike, could you... Um, I'm getting a little um, interference with your... Could you unplug and then replug your headset? Yes, yes. So we'll just uh, give Mike a second there. Sometimes uh, it, the, the equipment gets a little dodgy after a while. Uh, but Let's try that again. Perfect. That sounds great. <laughs> awesome. Do you need me to repeat the question or do you? So, yeah, so I think the question was they have a family that arrived at Castle Garden in like 1848. Yep. Good news is you're just two years away from that super important 1850 U.S. Census, where we get for the first time the names of all uh, persons in a family. Other good resources that I, that I didn't have time to mention are U.S. city directories. Uh, we're working on a very large collection we've already announced that will be later published later this year of city directories from and across the entire country and also looking to do similar projects from other uh, countries as well. The city directories were published yearly. The bad news is you're usually only going to see the head of household. Uh, so you could try to find, for example, a city directory from maybe the New York, New Jersey area from, you know, 1849 if you don't want to try to wait to see where they are in 1850. Uh, you know, they, they, immigrants like that might have just very quickly taken uh, passage on, say, train or, or other transportation to other parts of the country. Uh, they could have quickly gone to Ohio or, you know, other parts, South Kentucky, North Carolina, you name it, uh, after arriving, or they could have stayed in the greater New York area for a while and tried to work for a little bit. Uh, the census, that 1850 census, is probably going to be your best bet, and then next to that I would probably suggest trying to find a city directory. Later this year, we hope to help you with that city directory search. Okay. Pat would like to know, can you use wildcards in my heritage searches? Yes. Uh, there are uh, capabilities to use wildcards and actually to control what sort of default wildcarding will occur if you go to the advanced search templates on MyHeritage. So whenever you look at a collection on MyHeritage or a group of collections or a category, by default you'll see a basic template, but if you click in the upper right uh, hand corner of the template, you'll see an advanced search uh, link. This gives you the ability to also control some of the phonetic indexing al algorithms uh, that we do. Uh, the wildcards, I do believe, uh, uh, must have three preceding characters, and then uh, you can use like a star. So I could look for J O H star for you know things like John Sun or John Sen, things like that. Okay. Uh, in regards to naturalization, Cola wants to know, were women grandfathered in under the Act of 1855 until 1922? I hope that's not too specific. <laughs> yeah, so, so women were receiving derivative citizenship through their husbands uh, from those acts in the early 18, from the mid-18, well, really even prior to the 1850s. It was sort of finally enshrined in those 1850 acts. But from what I've been able to uh, research, uh, that, that 
that was in force until September 1922, when there was an act that uh, repealed that derivative citizenship for uh, spouses, for uh, women, for wives. All right, uh, Julianne wants to know, um, well, she says those circular charts that you had um, are really great. The ones where, like you showed the Irish immigrants and then where in the US they went. She's, inter uh -huh. she's interested where those charts come from. Yeah, those are charts that, that I made. Uh, so I guess I would attribute them to myself. Okay, so uh, there's, I'd be no, happy, there's no uh, nifty I'd be happy. program, huh, that you can just plug in the oh, data oh, and it no, just I, churns it uh, out? <laughs> yeah. I, I'm sorry, there, there certainly is some software that okay. there's some open source software and other systems that can help people uh, create those. Mm -hmm. uh, if, some, if they do want to email me, I'd be happy to share more information uh, about those visualizations. Okay, and I will put your email again into the chat. There we go. All right. Um, now, Maria, uh, is asking a question about immigration. You, you sort of touched on this with your um, case study at the end, but I'm going to offer this up anyways. Uh, she says, my great great grandfather came to the United States from Italy, as in your example. Uh, I can't find the parents or county he came from, nothing on any documents. Maria, the only thing is, when did your ancestor come to the United States. I think that would make a big difference. I think with everything with immigration and naturalization, it's all about when they came. Um, and yeah, and, yeah, and again, I would, I definitely, yeah, you, you got to know the when, but also who else can be very important. So maybe they came too late to be included in that draft registration, but that doesn't mean a brother or an uncle might not have preceded them and they might have been picked up by that draft registration and if you look look at other family members to see if they could be in that World War I draft registration, it's just an incredible resource for nailing down uh, immigrants. Not all not all registrations will give you uh, you know the exact detailed specific locality, meaning a, a town or village, but many of them for immigrants do. I love 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 that suggestion. Do collateral research. You have to go beyond your ancestor to siblings, aunts, uh, uncles, cousins with these groups, and, and especially, you know, it's Italians and Irish. Um, so, all right. Um, okay, this is a little involved. Um, I don't know if it's too much asking you this, but maybe you can tackle it. You, you were talking about the obit with the primary and secondary information. Uh, mm -hmm. So Aaron wants to know, what is the difference between primary and direct versus secondary and indirect? Sure. So primary and secondary are re really a way that, that a good genealogist is evaluating the likely reliability, the likely that any information on any document is truthful. Not that we're doubting the intention of the information provider. You know, we, we generally dis discount, you know, known malfeasance. These people weren't trying to deceive. But in the case of a death certificate, if I'm being asked about the birthplace of my spouse's mother, I might just be guessing, right? And so that's secondary information. I, I don't really maybe have very good firsthand information about that versus if, if I'm the person that actually was present when my husband or wife died, I'm a very reliable source to provide information that was recorded. So primary evidence is this notion of how closely in time and sort of space, if you will, you know, personal experience, the information would have been recorded or supplied to someone that was recording it. So when you think about a, a census document, what's primary in a census document, the primary information in a census is really about who's living at this place. Most of the other information is secondary, right? We're getting information about people's ages and occupations and all sorts of stuff, but that might have been given by the 12-year-old boy that happened to be home when the census worker came, right? So we always need to be a little cautious when we identify secondary evidence because it's just not necessarily as reliable as we hope it would be. Uh, 
so there's secondary and primary, and then there's both direct and indirect, and they can kind of in, uh, intermingle. But uh, the, the direct is that example kind of like I showed, where if a, a historical document is specifically addressing uh, an event or some sort of thing, uh, like a, you know, yeah, a, a events maybe the best thing I can think of, versus one that lets us only infer or conjecture uh, in sort of the the legal field, sec, uh, this this type of information would be called circumstantial evidence, right? This this infant was baptized on this day. We might infer or make a conjecture or a very good educated guess that they were born within the preceding week or two, but we don't have direct specific knowledge of that birth date because the documents just don't tell us. Okay. I don't know if that's I think that's a good start um, helpful there is uh, information on the um, board for certification uh, genealogy website um, if you want to go to the board for certification website they do have that there I think um, okay in terms of passenger lists, just a couple requests or questions. Um, Lois asks, will you be doing Baltimore? We can say that Baltimore is already in the library, right? Um, so, so for a number of the, of, of the collections, we have a few different components. So I do believe if you go to the MyHeritage uh, Super Search system and if you look for Baltimore, you'll see an earlier Baltimore passenger list uh, on the slide that I mentioned were, were about to release in the next few weeks is a more recent Baltimore passenger okay. list, I think from the late 1800s to the okay. mid 1900s. Yeah, so currently, and that's, currently it's 1820 to 1897 on the site right now. 1820, right. And so the next yeah. one we're doing is, is after that, okay, 1898 great. to I think like the 1950s. Excellent. And then Shirley, um, nope, not Shirley. Let's see. Bobby was asking about Charleston, South Carolina, and Emma was asking about Canada and Newfoundland. So questions about immigration to South Carolina? No, passenger list, if you'll be getting any passenger of those. List. Yeah, so uh, there's some of the eastern uh, seaboard eastern cities on the eastern seaboard, if I'm saying it right, are in a collection called Miscellaneous Atlantic Ports. And this is also a collection that we've been working on and preparing to release. Uh, I'd have to look if Charleston specifically is in that one or if it's in a different one. If it's not, then it's, it's, it's also others that we have forthcoming. We have a very large inventory of of passenger lists that we're working on. And then the other question was about uh, Newfoundland in Canada. Yeah. Uh, passenger lists, a good place to start for passenger lists in Canada is definitely at Library and Archives Canada. Uh, passenger lists in Canada start to be re fairly robustly recorded in the, I think about 1867. Uh, Newfoundland is a bit of a special case. It was sort of a territorial uh, possession. You'd have to see what uh, was collected uh, for persons going to Newfoundland and, and Labrador and what might be at the National Archives. I'd also recommend definitely check out the provincial archives. Many of the Canadian provinces have very nice uh, provincial archives where uh, stuff like that might also be found. Okay, great. Uh, Teresa wants to know, how did you have that example from the 1890 federal census? If it was understanding that it was destroyed. Sure, yeah. So the vast majority of it was actually heavily damaged in a fire in 1921. Uh, a common misconception in our field is that it was destroyed in 1921, which it wasn't. It was just very heavily damaged, both by fire and then by the water used uh, to put out the fire. It was later uh, finally destroyed, I think, in 1932. And there are uh, about a thousand uh, documents like that I showed that did uh, survive. And so if you go to my heritage, you'll see a 1890 US federal census fragment, we call it. I think there you'll find only about 6,000 records. You know, if the census had survived, I think there would have been upwards of 90 million. 
Uh, most of the places that did survive in 1890 are in the D.C. area, and I think there's also maybe some from Alabama. But you would be really hitting the genealogical lottery hmm. if you have family uh, in the surviving 1890 U.S. federal census. Yeah. Marianne wants to know, uh, do you have a best guess, based on your previous experience and research, of how many people did or did not bother to get naturalized in the U.S.? That's a that's a great question. Uh, I don't have uh, an immediate answer off the top of my head, but again, we you know, kind of thinking about the things that I discussed today, with all of the derivative citizenships that would have been provided to uh, wives and children, uh, many quote unquote immigrants or the children of their Im of these immigrants or the wives of these immigrants really had no need to ever naturalize. Uh, some of the largest indexes that are available in the industry are measured in the in the single digit millions uh but I, i've never seen a reliable well i shouldn't say never i just don't recall seeing a a number of how many naturalizations are uh estimated to have occurred some of those books that i that i referenced or resources might might shed some light on that Right. Um, Beverly wants to know, in World War I, were alien males subject to the U.S. draft? That's a great question. I almost included a slide on that. There's some very interesting uh, history uh, about that. I, I believe I was reading an article on Wikipedia about it, and the answer is they were certainly subject to registration. So the World War I draft registration database contains something like, oh, it's north of 21 million records. 21 million men were included in that registration. The U.S. only filled a expeditionary force of just over 2 million men. So just because they're in the draft registration database doesn't mean that they, they actually served in World War I. Uh, I may have lost the first part of that question. Can you help me, Marianne, remember oh. what it was? Um, were aliens, uh, alien oh, males yes. required to? And the answer is yes. I, as I was looking and preparing for this talk, I saw several really interesting examples. I, I found a gentleman uh, from Liberia of African descent who was a British citizen. I found another gentleman who is Australian. He lists his hometown in uh, Victoria, Australia. Basically, if they were in the country, uh, they were feeling some significant pressure to register. Uh, there's some interesting articles uh, that I was looking at in newspapers published from the time. This was a very this was a very serious undertaking that the that the government here in the U.S. did. If a eligible uh, man was found without their sort of draft registration receipt or card, they would be subject potentially to immediate. Uh, draft into the military if they couldn't produce this uh, at certain mm. times. Mm. So there were some very uh, serious social pressure, I believe, uh, for all men to go and at least register. Now, there's 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 some interesting information you also find about uh, aliens of uh, combative nations. So, for example, if you were a German alien in the World War One draft registration, you you would still have been registered, but you likely would not have been selected. Uh, to be drafted into the military. All right. In a sort of related question, Kay wants to know, are there any reasons to have serial number or order number found on the draft cards for World War I and World War II? I don't, does it have any genealogical significance? That's a, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know if, so really two things were, were happening with the, you know, the World War I uh, obviously, men were enlisting of their own volition, and then they also did draft uh, others to meet sort of uh, quotas that they were trying to fill. I don't know if those numbers that we see on the draft registration cards lead us to other military uh, enlistment documents that may exist. That's a great question, but one that I've, I've never pursued. Okay. Uh, Anne wants to know if MyHeritage has any records from the 1740s. 1740s. Uh, it's going to depend. Uh, obviously, and some, you know, whenever I'm talking about my heritage, usually I'll, I'll talk about just the tremendous uh, community of users we have and the trees that they've contributed. Uh, 1740s in the U.S. It's going to be pretty limited. 
uh, we're working on a few, you know, sort of colonial collections. There'll be some books and things like that. I definitely encourage you to take a look at our book collection. I think I also have a webinar here at the my Heritage webinar series. I think it should be free. It's something about uh, the My Heritage book collection where I talk about that in some detail. So this is where you'll you'll find. Uh, I'm trying to remember the numbers. It's like half a million digitized books. So, for example, my wife has a lot of colonial New England heritage, and I'm pretty easily able to find published genealogies and other things uh, for her colonial line that certainly go back uh, to those early colonial days. It's going to be stuff like that, you know, uh, previously published genealogies, uh, materials like that. All right, and I was able to find the book webinar, so I'm putting that in the chat so you can see and that. And I, I think that one's also a free one, is it not? Yes. Uh, awesome. Yep, that is free. Yep. All right. Um, I have – Daniel, are you available for a question? I'm not sure if he's. Uh, yes, Marianne. <laughs> I am uh, very quietly enjoying uh, this webinar. Uh, and yes, for sure. Great. If I've I got a um, a My Heritage Live 2019 question. Uh, Mark wants to know: Will Live 2019 have recorded sessions as Live 2018 did? Uh, well, that is an information that we are still not managing. Uh, Mark will need to wait uh, in order to hear about it as soon as as we decide. On that, uh, you can be sure we are going to advertise. Uh, but uh, and I understand the difference, uh, like especially uh, monetary, between coming to the conference itself and and hearing it from home. Uh, but definitely, you're you're going to lose a lot of uh, the insights and and the mingling with other people present over there uh, if you're not in Amsterdam this uh, September. So the invitation goes uh, to everybody to register and come to Amsterdam and more news will be rela uh, released very soon. And I'm not sure who wants to tackle this question, but uh, Mike talked about so many uh, different record groups in MyHeritage. Uh, and in, when you were talking about the newspapers, there was particular uh, questions about this. What uh, sort of subscription does it take to gain access to the, my, to the newspaper collections or um, generally to the collections you've been talking about? Sure. So, so, so the most common, <clears throat> excuse me, the most common uh, subscription that most of our users have now is that complete subscription. That gives you not only all of the historical records that we have on MyHeritage, but also all of the amazing tree tools, unlimited uh, storage capacity with your tree. Uh, and then you can also get access just to the records if you want through a data subscription. So if you, if you like, if maybe you have your tree offline and something like Legacy or some other uh, software like that, then a data subscription would also serve you well. All right, I'm trying to see if I can go to the website and and normally I'm logged in uh, so let's see if it gives me an hmm I don't oh here maybe this will have the prices I can't pull it up I'm sorry folks um, I'm always logged into my heritage so I never um, need to go to the pages oh okay. all right maybe I can pull it up here I bet, I bet Daniel can rip the prices off from memory. Daniel? <laughs> Hold on. I, I think I uh, well, I actually never do that. I encourage everybody to go into their own website and, and just go uh, either on the topper bar. When you say go premium, we will give you both the price for premium, uh, premium plus and complete. Or in any case that you will try to access a record uh, and, and you don't have the proper um, account paid, uh, I'm pretty sure you will hit a paywall and we will be very specific on the amount uh, that you need to pay and, uh, and, and whatever benefits you are getting from the different accounts. 
Uh, actually, some people may see on the very bottom of the website on, on a menu that you have over there, uh, and, and I'm trying also to get myself there, um, there is a link that says price list, and I am right now going there with my own website. Here, I'm going to pull it over to the, is this what you're talking about? Can you see that uh, on the yes, screen? Exactly. Okay. Exactly that one. So you can see the different prices and, and the different offers uh, that that we have. Uh, so if you want records, is either the data plan that you have over there standalone or the complete account that Mike was uh, mentioning. It will include the data and the records, as you can see. Okay. And just notice there are different first year prices uh, that are lower when you're starting out. All right, well, I think that is going to conclude our webinar for today. And actually, maybe I should put that back there. Maybe that was too quick. Sorry, people are always complaining that I take things away too quickly. Um, so thank you, Mike, so much for your wonderful presentation. I really enjoyed it, and I know the audience did as well. Uh, Cola is clapping right now, and... Um, and Jim is saying great information. So, oh, some person uh, during the webinar actually requested that you come back and do one just on naturalization, the whole hour on naturalization. So maybe you'll consider that for the future. Yeah. So coming up uh, later this uh, later this year, it may even be in April. I'd have to look. I'm doing just a whole hour just on censuses around the world. Okay. That'll great. be a fun one. But yeah. As you can see, we could easily spend a whole hour on nothing but naturalization. Exactly. Maybe even naturalization exactly. just for the U.S., let alone Canada or Australia or other immigrant-rich countries. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Mike. And thank you, Daniel, for stepping in and participating there at the end. <laughs> and uh, so Alrighty. we always like to have both of you here. And we'll look forward to seeing everyone on April 9th for... Um, the DNA webinar. So look forward to seeing it, you all. Bye-bye. Goodbye.